I'm thankful to be here um, as a guest, filling in for one of the great, one of the greatest preachers on this side of heaven. Um, amen. You guys are blessed. Uh, I mean, he's a great communicator, dear friend, and so uh, obviously great shoes and big shoes to fill in. And so um, you guys that know you're going to get the bald head black preacher today. Amen. <laughs> so uh, it's all good. So. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Mandy, for uh, 10 years, and um, there's a picture of my family there. Uh, my wife, Mandy, beautiful queen, and uh, I have Sarai, my oldest, on this side. She's seven. Amaya is five in the middle. You can see she's ready to go, and that's the one you got to pray for me for. Amen. <laughs> and then uh, we have little Nene. That's daddy's little girl right there, boy. So that's little Naomi, and uh, that's my beautiful family there. just want you guys to at least see a little bit more about me, kind of instead of just getting up and be the guest speaker, at least kind of let you into my life um, to some degree. Well, we're thankful to be here. I'm thankful my wife allowing me to come, amen. You know, so that's always a good thing. Um, but one thing about my wife, she's, she's very interesting. She loves to shop. She loves to shop. Somebody said, amen. That's not a surprise still. Wives, amen. Um, and so, but we love Target. We love Target, man. It's kind of Target. We kind of like Target, man. We call it Target. And this one particular day, my wife and my girls, they were um, shopping, and I was at the office at the church, and, uh, you know, she called after this had transpired. And so what had happened, uh, they were leaving, we purchased, they purchased, excuse me, they purchased some of our favorite popcorn, it's like Smart Pop, like the white cheddar one or whatever it is, it's very good. And so, but it's really particularly good to Amaya, my middle. She loves it, so much so, uh, as they were leaving Target, they got to a red light, and in North Carolina, certain places you can't turn on right, so it's kind of, they were stuck. They couldn't go anywhere. And on, their, on the right side of the car, there was a lady with two kids, one little one um, in her arms, probably two and a half, three years of age, and um, just there. And so uh, my wife rolls down the window. She had a sign. You have money. My wife goes, hey, look, we don't have any money. Um, you know, and so as she's holding this baby, the baby peers into our van. And the baby sees the popcorn. Yeah. Now, mind you, this is very dear. This popcorn is like the gospel to Amaya. Amen. So the baby looks in, the baby goes, eh. So the baby wants the popcorn. And so in essence, uh, my wife, being a godly lady as she is, she takes the popcorn out the bag and she gives it to the lady. And the little baby's like happy now, eh, real happy. And so Amaya, though, ooh, right, she's mad. Everything just completely changed. The whole culture in the car changed that quick. And so what happened, um, you know, they, they were driving off, and my wife goes, Amaya, I'm so proud of you. I know you love that popcorn, but I want to tell you something. Jesus is proud of you as well. So much so, I mean, he knows exactly what you did. I mean, you, you did exactly what Jesus would want you to do in that moment. Uh, uh, just know this, baby girl, that God is, he's very pleased with you. And so Maya's like, yeah, you know, that's really good. Yes, oh God, yeah, yeah, little, little five-year-old trying to process this theologically. And so there's silence in the car. And then out of nowhere, the silence is interrupted by Maya going, you know what, I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven to tell Jesus what just happened. And my wife goes, no, 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 baby. Remember, you just, you just heard me say that Jesus, he knows everything. He knows exactly why. Uh, you gave the popcorn. He saw your heart and your attention and your attitude behind it. She goes, no, 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 mommy. No, no, no. That's not what I'm going to ask Jesus and tell him. I'm going to ask Jesus and I'm going to tell him that I want my popcorn back. Amen. <laughs> That's bold, boy. That's bold. That's bold. Uh, yeah, I want my popcorn back. She missed it. She missed it. And even as I snapped my fingers three times, I mean, so fast, in one breath stroke, if you will, you and I in culture, in our Christianity, in our walks with Jesus, being a part of the church, we can miss it. We can miss it very unintentionally. We can miss it um, because of what we're going to deal with today, and that's busyness. We can definitely miss it because of our schedules and the busyness and the chaoticness of, of life. And we live in really what many scholars and theologians would say that the most populated culture of all time but then also the most busiest. We have access to so much stuff. I mean, this is, this is true. I mean, in essence, I mean, with our calendars, our calendars are bombarded. My wife, she puts things on my calendar, and I'm like, babe, you have to stop this. Amen. I mean, 
There's so much, it's just everything, boom, a reminder. Something is popping up. Something is always, is always begging for your attention. What about work? Some of us, we, we work so much that we've sacrificed our family in the process. What about personal, our personal lives? Just the demands of it. What about relationships, hobbies, travel, uh, little league, kid sports, emails, text messages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all this other, all these different platforms, they're begging for my attention and for your attention. I mean, if you believe, you don't believe me, you don't have to, but this is going to be true scripturally. I, I thoroughly believe that this is one of the, the aching or ailing things in our culture today. The fact of being so busy, we miss what Jesus is going to teach us in Luke chapter 10, but in also what he underscores in the entire chapter of Luke chapter 10, which is the power, there's power in the pause. There's power in the pause in the sense of you and I, when we're in the midst of chaoticness and being busy, we can pause and just see exactly what God is doing and what he desires us to do. To glean from it. So today what we're going to do is take a moment and look at a couple characters out of Luke 10, starting in verse 38. You can have, if you have your Bibles, turn there. 38 through 42, very familiar passage of scripture, very familiar narrative. Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary. Amen. Some of y'all, when I said that, it's like, oh gosh, because we're busy. When was the last time, I mean, like as a pastor, I, I rarely hear somebody come in and say, pastor, you know, I'm struggling. Okay, what's going on? I'm just, I'm busy. I struggle with busyness. You don't hear that. It's, it's kind of a, a deception and a deceiving thing that the enemy throws at believers. And we periodically, out of our mouths, we said, how you doing? Oh, I'm so busy. It's like a, a, a cliche, quick knee-jerk reaction statement that we articulate quite often. And, and I don't think we really process what we're truly saying when we say that. And so today, I'm not saying that schedules are bad. I'm not saying that calendars are bad. I'm not saying that Little League um, um, games and things of that nature is not bad. I'm not saying that none, none of that's bad. Uh, for the most part, it's amoral. But what happens, as we're going to see in the Bible today, is that when you and I make a good thing an ultimate thing, it ultimately becomes a destructive thing. So in our text today, Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38, the Bible says this, Now as they went on their way, now Luke being a doctor, very very detailed. He wants us to really highlight and kind of look back, if you will, at the previous context. Because I think what, what the Lord is really driving home here is that, the, again, the power in pausing. Don't miss it. Jesus entered a village. Now, I might say this as well, based on the context, Jesus um, was with other people. wasn't just by himself. He just didn't walk into Martha's house or Mary's house. He didn't just walk in by himself. Most likely, based on the context, he had disciples with him and probably a couple other um, ragtag people following him because he, had, he was a great teacher and he was the Messiah. And so they were following him, and they went into this house, and the Bible says this, and, um, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. What a beautiful picture. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? That's crazy. I, it's always interesting that when we're in chaotic times, we always question God's care for us. And we see this in a text. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her, ooh, it's crazy right here, right? I can see the finger wagging and all that. You better tell her, right? Just tell her. Tell her then to help me. Verse 41 said, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious. You're anxious and troubled about many things. Many, not just singular, but plural. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So what I would like to do today, in my brief time, <laughs> amen, I'm going to make sure we get out on time this time, amen, It's just really build a case, um, looking at lessons from each character. In this short narrative, there's so much to articulate and unpack, so much so, we're at first, I mean, the first thought will be we're going to look at lessons from serving Martha, and then we'll look at lessons from sitting Mar Mary, and then we're going to look at really lessons from Jesus. I think that's a great way to park the car. So again, we're plagued by busyness. So in this text, the Lord doesn't want us to miss anything. 
Now, before I get to the pros and cons of Martha's life, let me just put a couple of markers out for you. Martha is the main character, or it may appear to be that way. It appears to be that Martha is the, mer- the, the main character. This is always the case when we hear this story. We, we put a lot of emphasis on Martha, which is true. I mean, in some sense, Martha is kind of like the antagonist in the text, if you want to call it that, if you want to categorize her in a particular setting. She's the antagonist in the text, and really, I'm going to steal a little thunder and tell you that really Jesus is the main character. Duh, right? If you're in Sunday school or vacation Bible school, say, what, what is, blah, 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 what's the answer to this? Jesus, right? Just say Jesus, amen. But he is. All of Scripture points to him. So she's really not the main character. So you think. She always gets a bad rap, kind of like Thomas, doubting Thomas. We all know that guy, right? And, but Martha is kind of that individual you will not like to be in conversation with outside in the lobby or in, at the mall or at a restaurant. You see him out in public. Why? Because she's the one that will be saying hi to you, shaking your hand, but also looking past you like this here. In, in essence, like, uh, you're really not that important, and I'm, I'm not really in tune with what you're going through right now. And it's that word care. And then now let's look at some of the pros and cons. Pros. So point A is this, is that she had a heart for Jesus. She really had a heart for Jesus. We see this. She welcomed him in the house. The Bible declares, Luke writes, she welcomed him into the house. That's a big step. She had a heart for Jesus. And before we go any further, I want to say that this is uh, to her defense, regardless of what else we may think, it is clear that she loves the Lord and does what she does out of love and not out of obligation. She respects Jesus so much that without hesitation, she wants to honor him with using her gifts to prepare a meal in his honor. That's really what she's desiring to do. But in route of serving him, the purity of her actions didn't line up with the attitude of her heart at all. You're going to see this throughout the text. So she had a heart to serve. She had a heart for Jesus. She had a heart to serve. We see this. She welcomed him in, but she also began to serve him. She desired to serve him. This is interesting. Why? Because it's big in Bible times. You always not always, but when someone was welcomed into a house, that was a big deal. In essence, that showed honor, respect, care. I appreciate you. But here's the cons. Those are a few pros, but here are the cons about serving Martha. She lost her focus. She lost her focus so much so, Martha, she resorted to self-pity. I said a little while ago what happens when you and I resort to or resort to self-pity. We take good things and take them and make them an ultimate thing and ultimately they become destructive things. Now, by the way, these things, they're good things and necessarily they were never set up by God to be the ultimate thing. So this could be marriage in our own lives. This could be our own jobs. This can be what your retirement. This can be whatever. This could be whatever. Good thing, but when you and I begin to turn into an ultimate thing, inevitably what happens, it becomes a destructive thing because it tries to take the place of of the Lord. So what happened? Amen back there. Amen. So what happens? Her, Martha, her values were misplaced. You know, your value and my value should come from Jesus. So as she's studying, I mean, as she's serving the Lord, I can see her in there just holding all these plates. And by the way, in our culture, my culture, you know, in, in my house, we have so many little kids. We have a lot of young family, young married couples over to the house. And And we're always feeding people, and I can only wash so many dishes, amen. And the dishwasher only can do so many cycles. So we have paper plates. Any paper plate lovers in the house? Amen, that's what I'm talking about, amen. So the paper plates, but I can see, if I can use my uh, spiritual mind here, I can see Martha in the office, in, in the kitchen with all these plates, stuff boiling over. She has her apron on, and you can smell the goodies coming from the kitchen. You can smell it, the aroma. She put the right cumin and the right oregano and all this stuff in there, and it's filling the house, smelling good, but she misses the mark and realizes that the real host and the real purpose for Jesus to be in the house is for her to be at his feet. But she doesn't catch that. Rather, she gets caught up in serving serving him you see here's the deal you and i included i want to include myself in this because i'm preaching to myself when i talk about busyness when we refuse god's offer of grace-filled rest in the living room we the only alternative is the tyranny of the urgent or work and we see this she criticizes jesus in verse 40 she says hey look man but martha was uh, uh, and, excuse me, let's see, verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving, 
And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? Now, this is not new. This is a track record with Martha. I mean, this is something we see in John 11, verse 21. After Lazarus had died, remember this story, this account, when she uh, confronted Jesus and said this, Jesus, if you had not, if you would have been here a little bit earlier. Now, isn't this interesting that you and I in our own lives, sometimes we're not bold enough up top, we're not bold enough to necessarily say um, verbally these things to the Lord, but we, we articulate them with our mouth. And y'all know this to be true. We communicate 70% more with our body language than what we say out of our mouths. And so in essence, she criticizes the Lord and this word distracted I love Luke's writing. This word distracted is loaded. It has a triple meaning in essence. It really means this, to be pulled in two directions. Jesus says, look, sis, you're so distracted. You're pulled in two different directions. I love the fact that you're serving me, but I would rather have you sit at my feet and and hear from me. Let's let's don't get it twisted. Not allow serving to take place of worship. So she criticized him. It really means to choke out. It really means to be dragged along. And then what happens? She begins to blame her sister. Unrealistic expectations is another thing we see out of the cons. Unrealistic expectations. She misplaces her priorities and misdirect anger. And then what happens? When that happens, guess what? Fault finding is very close behind. Unrealistic expectations. You know this. If you're married in the room, you know this. Unrealistic expectations. And by the way, if you desire to have your spouse meet all of your needs, you are setting them up for failure. That's counseling one-on-one. Amen. Maybe that was for somebody. But what happens when those expectations are not met, misplaced priorities, misdirected anger, and then fault finding? We see this all the way through the Bible. We see it in Genesis 3. Adam blaming the Lord. Well, you gave me this wife. Just a chapter or so before that, he said, hey, look, uh, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. He was just praising the Lord for this, this bomb lady he had just received from the Lord. But then after this, he begins to blame God. And what happens is, stay with me, the enemy, he never, he doesn't really want us to, to really doubt God's existence, but he will get you and I to doubt God's goodness. He will always try to get you to doubt God's goodness about the circumstances and the situations that you're in. Well, why am I in this? If God truly cared, then they wouldn't let this happen. And that's his MO. It starts from the beginning. We see this even in our text today in Luke chapter 10. So Martha's problem is that she doesn't think she has a problem. Y'all know that, right? She thinks everyone else has a problem but her. We know this to be the case. Sometimes in our own lives, it's everybody else's fault, and it's never our fault. Then a compare game happens. Well, look what I'm doing, Jesus. Look at here. Look in the kitchen. And by the way, I think it was an open concept. I'm not for sure, but I think it was an open concept house to where you can look in. As soon as you walk in the door, you saw Jesus kicking it with the 12 and everybody else, all the other misfits. But then you saw Martha right in the kitchen with all those paper plates. You can smell the aroma in the house. Look at what I'm doing, Jesus. Hey, look what I'm doing. Hey, matter of fact, the Bible says, hey, look, hey, tell her, my sister, to come over here and help me. Very dangerous. The compare game. She got caught up in exterior things versus her heart being caught up in the right thing. Mere serving and giftedness doesn't equal spirituality. The problem is this. Martha wanted God to respond at her beckoning. Doesn't it trouble you sometimes that when you pray, things don't happen immediately? There's tension in the text. We see this. We know God always answers prayers. Yes, no, or wait. You're not ready. But even in this, Martha wanted God to respond to her her beckoning. You see, the issue in our culture today, I'm talking about 2019 right here in Little Rock, Arkansas, is this. Our culture is teaching us that the immediate is better than God's sovereign timing. The immediate, I got to have it right now, the click of a button. I mean, I want the 30 second. As a matter of fact, I love the 30 second button on the microwave. I love it. It's like a savior. Amen. But what happens with that, with that mindset and ideology, when it impacts our theology and our framework of thinking, we want immediate results, and this happens in our culture. And what happens when this happens is the immediacy of having things right now damages our view of who God is and how he works. You see, in God's kitchen, there are no microwaves, only crockpots. God works on his own timetable, and this is something God is teaching Martha. He said, Martha, I don't want you to miss it. 
I, I th- thank you for serving me. Thank you for the paper plates. Thank you for the great smell in the house. Thank you for all this great stuff. I, I, yes, I've wired you with that, and I see your, your passion for me, but I do not want you to miss the main thing. The main thing is me. And it's interesting, as we see, we look at Mary, and see how she's at his feet, and he's teaching her. This is why Jesus came in the first place, teaching that this new kingdom was coming. And Martha was... She was missing it. You see, if we are not careful, in the Christian walk, your desire to serve Christ can actually pull you away from time with Christ. It sounds like an oxymoron, but it's very true. If it goes unchecked, only awe of God is capable of keeping work or whatever these things may be in its right place. And that's just what I mean by awe is saying, God, I want to take you serious. I take you serious. There's awe and there's respect. And when I put those two together, really in essence, those mean I want to take you serious. I love you so much so. You spoke everything to existence. You wired me for certain things. You gave me a purpose. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I have this family. I have all these things. Thank you, God. I have a house. I have clothes. All this stuff that I have. You are a great and wonderful God. And when we have a great awe of who he is, what happens, it keeps everything in, it keeps it in place. God, you're first. And all this other stuff, secondary, tertiary, whatever the case may be, it all falls in its right, in its right place. And then having a proper awe of who he is ultimately liberates you and I from a life distorting bondage to awe of everything else. Here are a couple of red flags that, that you and I, I know that I do this quite often, is if we're prioritizing service or other things over genuine and pure worship to God. We begin to feed the, most, the monster of self-pity. Verse 40 says, But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him. Look at that bowl. She went up to him. Like, read this with attitude. She was upset. I really don't think it was a, like a kind conversation. The Bible says she's, this is something we normally will walk, read over, but she walks up to him. Jesus, with Mary at his feet, the disciples learning from him and all the other ragtags, she interrupts this conversation. She walks up to him, says, Lord, which is interesting because she, had a, she understood something, do you not care? that my sister has left me to serve alone. Very interesting. She began to feed the monster of self-pity. Here's a second thing, red flag, that you and I may be prioritizing stuff over genuine worship to the Lord is this. We tend to think that we know more than God. So maybe the season that you're in, you're trusting God for an answer, maybe trusting for the next season. How about this? Maybe this message is for you. God is saying, don't miss it. There's power in the pause. Maybe the next job, maybe the next um, boat, maybe the next whatever the case may be. How about just sitting and resting? How about saying, God, you're so wonderful. I have everything that I need. I don't need anything else per se. God, everything that I have. As a matter of fact, when I worship you, as John Piper would say, worship is basically this. We have God's air in our lungs. We're on borrowed time. And so worship is really saying, God, I'm giving you your breath back. This is all about you. So this is what God is saying through the writer Luke and saying, I don't want you to miss this. Don't miss it, Martha. And so a lot of times we miss it ourselves. And, and then Jesus says, you're anxious about many things. We'll look at his response in a little bit. But do you notice that 40% of the things that you and I, 40% of the things that you and I worry about never really happen. H- have you ever turned a worse, like a worst case scenario into like the ultimate worst case scenario? And like it never really happens. Then 30% about the past. Maybe some things that you and I worry about anxiety-wise about the past. And maybe there's some legitimacy there, right? Maybe some things you did on spring break. Maybe some things you did in the past that, has pre- that have present results today. But most likely, those are things that you and I cannot necessarily change. 12% is the criticism that you and I, we get from most or other people, mostly untrue. Being criticized by other people, maybe your parents, maybe you never amounted to be uh, much in their eyes. I don't know. Maybe siblings, there's a compare game in the house. I don't know the case, but what happens is we were bombarded and then we become shackled under 12%. 
10% is health, which is legitimate. And by the way, anxiety hinders health even more and worry. And then 8% about real problems that possibly can be solved or have solutions to them. Here's the deal. You and I will never drift into worship. We never naturally, you and I, we never drift into worship. What we just experienced a little while ago was beautiful, but we never naturally drift into worship. But you and I, we naturally drift into works. Martin Luther said this, he said, we are hardwired, we are hard, you and I, we're hardwired for works righteousness. And we're going to see what the gospel looks like through this text in just a little bit. The core problem with Martha is this, that, hey, look, is that she tried to impose her value system on her sister. This is very interesting. We see this a lot in our culture. Lord, tell her to do this. I got all these paper plates now. Come on, I can't, I can't balance any more plates. You need to tell her to do this. And we see this this way in our culture, in the sense of preferences turning into conviction. We have a preference about whatever this may be, and we, we die on this hill of preferences, and then what happens, this, whatever this may be, if it's not really necessarily gospel or biblical, it's a preference nonetheless, and I'm not saying that may be a wrong thing in your life, but it's a preference nonetheless. It's your preference. And then what happens, we die on this hill and it becomes a conviction, and a conviction, what happens if everybody else don't line up with your preference and your conviction, you begin to impose your preference and conviction on their lives. So why don't you worship like I worship? Why don't you have tattoos? Or why do you have tattoos? Or whatever the case may be, we can go down a laundry list of those. And, and the Lord is very sovereignly not even responding directly to our question. It's very interesting because I'm still a little thunder. I'm going to go here real quick. But Daryl Bach says this, in the Gospels, you see a pattern. You see Jesus not getting involved when people ask him to get involved. Like, get involved, get involved, do something, Jesus. Step in right now, get involved. Who's the greatest? Blah, 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 blah. And Jesus never really gets involved. Have you noticed that? See, what happens, we miss his presence. It's the most simplistic thing, but it's the thing that you and I struggle with the most, but also the enemy wants to steal the most from us. It's spending quality time with Jesus. Lesson two from um, Sit and Mary. I told you, African American pastor. That was just the first. Um, that was just the first uh, uh, point. So y'all got to get ready. Amen. I was at one place and they said, "Pastor, you only have five minutes." I said, "You got the wrong dude." Amen. I said, "You got the wrong guy." So, but let's let's look at a couple of lessons from from sitting Mary. We see a common theme in her life as well that she's sitting. Three times in Scripture we see this. We see it in our text today, John, I mean Luke 10. We see it also in John 11 when she's anointing Jesus' feet with her, hair, with her hair. We see it right there. This is the account of Lazarus' death, if you will. We also see it in John chapter 12. So there's this theme with her life, and there's a theme with Martha's life. What's the theme of your life? Is it trust in Jesus? No matter what, no matter what the culture is saying, no matter what, how your feelings are, are feeling per se, no matter what may be going on, are you trusting the word of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ? That you're, fearf you're fearfully and wonderfully made, you're fully known and also fully loved. You don't have to run from him in shame. You can run to him in repentance and find grace and mercy. What is the theme of your, of your life? And so what we see is this, is that sitting is quietness. We see her sitting at his feet, Mary. And with me, I like to turn on stuff. I, you know, if I'm studying, I got, you know, earbuds in, TV on. That's probably the max, because after that, I'm like, I'm very distracted. But it's a new research going on that some millennials and even the Gen Z culture can have like six to eight things going on at the same time. That scares me. But that's how busy we are as a, as, a, as a culture. Sitting means quietness. Lord, I'm listening. How often do you get into your prayer closet and your time with, with the Lord in prayer and you just rush into praying? Lord God, man, forgive me for this. Lord, please bless this. Lord, today, make it be a good day. Blah, 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 blah. We just rush into, we just bombard into the Holy of Holies. What about sitting and letting them speak to you? And then we see, we see Mary at his feet. 
closeness, intimacy, capacity, and then power. She's listening, she's attentive, but she's listening to his word with the intent to apply. So his word, there's this idea of submission. He's teaching her. You say, Marcus, man, why, do you, why are you barking all this stuff? Why are, you, why are you barking at all this stuff? Well, because Jesus is worthy. God is far more interested in his love relationship with you. Hear me say this. Than what you and I can necessarily do for him. He's more concerned about your love relationship with him. D.L. Moody said this, my alma mater, he said this, let God have your life. Let God have your life. Let him have your life. And maybe today for the first time you're saying, God, I'm going to surrender and I'm truly going to give you my life. I've been the boss. I've been the CEO. I've been the shot caller up until this point. And maybe today, just maybe, God is saying, give me your life. Let God have your life and he can do more with it than you can. So what happens is we see this This tyranny, this desire to allow schedule to become more. It's okay to have a schedule, saints. It's not okay to allow your schedule to have you. You see, Martha, she missed it. She she failed to realize that Jesus was in the house. Let me draw this point. I didn't say it in the first hour. She invited him in into her house. Stay with me. but she didn't have rest. She invited Jesus in, but even Jesus didn't feel at home. Could it be in some of our lives that we've we've invited Jesus in and he's like, man, I'm here to stay. Dropping off my majestic luggage, I'm here to stay to transform you through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm here to stay. But we don't give him access to rooms in our lives. Could it be? Well, look at the lessons from Jesus. Verse 41, it says this. It says it, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. It's always interesting when the Lord calls somebody named twice. Martha, Martha. Marcus, Marcus. Whatever the case may be. You are anxious and troubled about many things. What he's hearkening back to is Luke 8. The different soils. That one particular soil was being choked out so much It was worried about all the cares of the world. It was choking out what God was trying to produce and desire to produce in the actual plant and entity. And for us, you and I, it's what God desires to plant or produce in us. Jesus commends Mary without condemning Martha. And I want to highlight this. He cares for you. He cares for you. We can bring our needs to Jesus anytime and anywhere. It's not like he's upstairs being a grumpy grandfather. A lot of times we have a bad picture. Again, remember I talked about if we allow circumstances and the immediacy of stuff to thwart and mess up our view of who God is, that will mess up how we approach him. And if we even will come to him in the first place. But he's not upstairs going, man, man, come on, get it together. You see him, you dropped the ball. Do you know that his grace, man, he has more mercy than our mess. He loves us. As a matter of fact, you're a child and a daughter. You're a son and a daughter. He loves you. You're fearfully um, uh, made. I said it a while ago, you're fully known and you're fully loved at the same time. The picture of the gospel. He knows you. He wants to take care of that. But then also Jesus really comes uh, and really cares and approaches to us, and approaches us, excuse me, our concerns. He can say he's concerned about what we're concerned about. First Peter 5, 7. We see this and we know this to be the truth. Jesus also loves us enough, you and I, to confront us when our attitude is in a wrong place. And he, he commends Mary, but he doesn't condemn Martha. So gracious. Maybe today that's going to change your view of how you ought to relate to the Lord and how he relates to you. This is the gospel. This is, this is it. I mean, the gospel changes everything. Jesus accepts Martha where she is at, right there. And as she is, plates and all, He accepts her. He accepts you too. Our flesh, we're going to land a plane. Our flesh leads us to believe. As you read this text, you go, man, I'm more like Martha. I'm more like Mary. Man, I'm Mary. Ooh, I'm Mary. I'm sitting at Jesus' feet. Ooh, I'm at Jesus' feet. Man. But our flesh leads us to believe this way. But on the contrary, to be honest, you and I were more like Martha. 
And one of the easiest ways to combat this issue is to say, Jesus, I see you as beautiful and not just useful. Useful in the sense of salvation, yes, I get that. My, my get out of hell ticket or card, that's kind of useful. Just kind of being around Jesus and the things that, that comes with being around him. But beautiful in the sense of saying, Jesus, man, I love you so much so that I want to Luke 9, 23, I want to die to myself. I want to allow you to have my agenda. Lord, take my ambitions. Take my dreams. You are beautiful. You're worthy more than anything that I can conjure up or even think or plan for my own life. You are, you're beautiful. And then last year we say, Mark, as well, help me understand this better. I think the biggest issue is sometimes we just... We're so busy, we truly forget what Jesus has accomplished for us and what he desires to do through us. I was watching the National Geographic channel the other day, or Discovery Channel, and there was an episode about the possum. It was very interesting. Uh, yeah, young lad, that's fine. And so the possum, uh, you know, the possum is great. I mean, it's good. I like to watch this stuff, too. I have little girls, so I got to... Be careful, like letting them see lions and all that stuff, devour stuff. They'd be like, ah, nightmares. Is, and then it's bad. I got to go, you know, read Psalm 23 over them every night. You know, you know all right, Lord, the Lord, my shepherd, that's what I want. So their minds can dream good things. Amen. But the jungle is wild, man. It's all this different stuff in the jungles. And this particular episode of the Discovery Channel was the possum. And the narrative the narrator was just kind of talking. I was like, man, it's kind of intriguing. I'm going to stay here for a little bit. I'm not going to turn. I'm going to stay here. I want, to, I want to learn. I love to learn. And so as he began to articulate what was going on with this possum, he said, possums are a very intriguing species. So much so that they never like to build their own den. I said, oh, that's intriguing. Tell me more, narr narrator. They never like to build their own den. They never. So in other words, that's like a lot of people in our culture today, man, just smooching, right? I mean, really, to be honest with it. But they never like to really build their own den. So in essence, the possum, as it approaches a, a den, if it sees footprints going in and no footprints coming out, the possum concludes that whatever built the den is still in there. It's pretty good for a dumb animal. So I'm a lot like this possum, and you should be as well. When it comes to my Savior, I got to make sure that when it comes to Jesus, not a fabricated Jesus, not a cultural Jesus, but the, but the God of the Bible, Jesus of Scripture, when it comes to him and sitting at his feet, here's why it's so important. Here's why Jesus said, what Mary has chosen, this one portion I will not take from her. Why? Because this is it. He desires a love relationship with us and is made available through the gospel and through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's why it's important. You ready? You're supposed to say, Yes, I am ready, but that's fine. It was like, right? Because when it comes to my Savior, Buddha can't be my, Buddha can't be my Savior. Footprints going in, but no footprints, no footprints coming out. Muhammad, he, he can't be my, my Savior. And footprints going in, but no footprints coming out. Confucius can't be my savior. Why? Because footprints going in, but no footprints coming out. When it comes to Jesus Christ, footprints going in, he died. Footprints coming out, he rose. Footprints going in. Here's why Mary said, I'm choosing, I'm choosing this. And today, saints, I pray whether male, female, young, or old in this room, it doesn't matter. Choose today based on the gospel, based on what Jesus has accomplished for you through his life, his death, his resurrection, his purpose for your life. Choose this. Why? Footprints going in, he was the suffering one. Footprints coming out, he's the sovereign one. Footprints going in, he received death, but footprints coming out, he rebuked death for you and I. Amen. Footprints going in, he was pierced. He 
was pierced, his hands, his feet, his side, footprints coming out. He was praised, footprints going in. There was misery, but footprints coming out. There was straight up majesty, footprints going in. There were thorns, if you will, but footprints coming out. There were thrones, footprints coming in, going in. Uh, there was grief, but footprints coming out. There was straight up glory, and I'm glad that Jesus is alive. Footprints going in, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Footprints coming out, the lion from the tribe of Judah. Mary, Mary goes, here's where I'm going to sit because footprints going in and, and footprints going out. I want to sit at the master's feet. Footprints going in, the cross, but footprints coming out, crowns. Jesus is, because of this, in and out. Jesus is magnified. God is glorified. Salvation is qualified. Saints, uh, the saints are sanctified. Angels are, um, are, are gratified. Excuse me. Sinners are justified. The devil is horrified. Demons are terrified. Death is vilified. Hell is disqualified. Atheists are stupefied. And I want to tell you something else. Based on this, this great God, the great, this pausing and resting on Jesus Christ, Elvis, he was the king of rock, but he couldn't be my savior. Why? Because footprints going in. No footprints coming out. James Brown, the king of soul, footprints coming in, but no footprints coming out. Tupac, my generation, king of hip-hop, footprints going in, no footprints coming out. Bernie Mac, the king of comedy, footprints going in, but no footprints coming out. Michael Jackson, the king of pop, <laughs> the footprints going in, but no footprints coming out. But Jesus Christ allows us, you and I, to sit at his feet. Why? Because footprints going in and footprints coming out. Mary chose something great. She chose not to allow doubt and anxiety, and the tyranny of the urgent, to cause her love and compassion for Jesus to vacate. And I know that may be the case for many of us in this room. You say, Marcus, I don't know this God. Let's go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. You say, Marcus, I, I don't know. I want this Jesus. I want, I want to sit at his feet. I desire for him to be my savior. I've been the boss. And maybe as a young child, you've been the boss. Maybe uh, as a young professional in the room, you've been young married. I don't know the case, but you said, man, I, up until this point, really life has been a, about me. I haven't truly surrendered. Externally, I'm doing a lot of stuff, kind of like Martha. But internally, I'm missing something. Maybe that's you. And so today, based on the work of Jesus Christ, really repentance is basically saying, look, I have a change of, a change of mind that leads to a change of action. I was going in one direction. Now, Jesus, because of your work on the cross and that alone, I'm going to turn and go, to, I'm gonna go the other direction. I'm going to turn and go. I want to turn towards you. I want to embrace you by faith. Maybe that's you. We'll have some uh, pastors up here in a little bit. Guys can get ready. Uh, man, hey, we want to pray for you. But then secondly, I, I thoroughly believe this, that we're, we're all, if we can be honest before the Lord, we're busy as a culture. We're busy. We don't make adequate time for Jesus like we ought to because of all the things in our culture that's demanding our time. And we yield to those things more than we do to the voice of God. So for you, I'm going to say this too, man, we want to pray for you as well. You can come forward and say, look, I need to, I need to give this, whatever this may be. I've been putting this in front of the Lord. I've been putting this in front of worshiping, genuinely worshiping him. I can see I have Martha tendencies. I want to sit at his feet like Mary. So Jesus, Holy Spirit in this moment, Allow us to respond to the gospel with truth, conviction, and thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love that compels us and for footprints going in and footprints coming out. In Jesus' name, amen.